Uh, good afternoon. I welcome everyone to the 8th meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2015. I can ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they are switched to silent. No apologies have been received. Item 1, decision on taking business in private. The subcommittee is invited to agree considering item 3 in our work programme in private. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Item 6. I hope we can go up to about item six, item two, I six. <laughs> I've compressed it too much. Uh, hoping to, we've got really just till 1.15 till 2 p.m. on this, so bear that in mind. It's an evidence session on the I6 programme, Police Scotland's National ICT project. Now, welcome to the meeting. Deputy Chief Constable Neil Richardson, Chief Superintendent Hamish McPherson, Programme Manager for I6, and Martin Levin, Director of ICT. And we do have your most recent update in the programme, so I'll go straight to questions from members who know far more about this than I do. I try to look informed, but I'm just a punter as far as this goes, but I know others are. John, you're at the starting block, yes? Also a punter. So for that reason, um, an afternoon panel, can you tell us a bit more about why you needed to change the hardware in the most layperson's terms you can find, please? I'm happy to start that, and if you want a bit more detail, then I'll pass to somebody that knows more technical uh, uh, sort of detail than I, I do. The, the, the bottom line is that this was uh, something that was a, a, a vendor change, so in, in a sense, uh, hardware that was supplied by uh, an external uh, supplier, not Accenture in other words, uh, uh, introduced a, a change of conditions to that piece of hardware, which effectively meant that they were uh, not going to support it in the long term. Uh, now, effectively, that caused some concern for us moving forward with a brand new uh, facility uh, with some hardware that was reaching end of life. It was uh, unforeseen. Uh, nobody saw that coming. It doesn't just affect I6 or indeed Scotland. It's a global issue. Uh, and as a consequence, we were faced with a decision of what to do with that. Uh, clearly, it was going to necessitate a change of that particular component. Uh, and the real question is, do we do that now or do we do it later? Uh, the assessed position around these things is once you go live, and bearing in mind the sort of scale and the length of the rollout, the level of risk to the business uh, doing it after we've gone live is pretty considerable. So for uh, all sort of reasonable kind of measures, it's better to try and do that before we go live. So in essence, that was a decision that was taken. Um, we will uh, receive an alternative which will not uh, in, in affect us in cost-wise at all. Uh, in fact, the component that we will get in its, in, in its stead is actually a higher specification than the one we'd uh, planned. No other difference in terms of compatibility, that it remains exactly as specified. Uh, but it did involve uh, a change in the planned delivery. Uh, uh, as you will recall, we had intended to do what we were describing as a pilot in K-Division prior to going live. And that was ostensibly just to test some of the kind of the faults and make sure that the live operation was uh, seamless before it actually went live. Uh, and this change of hardware has meant that we can't or couldn't do that according to the initial plans. That said, we have developed an alternative approach, uh, which we believe will be every bit as robust. So prior to going live, uh, we will have full confidence in the equipment. And just to confirm, Mr. Richardson, it's the same company that's providing the upgraded version that was providing the original, is it? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, has this been looked at? Because it's the nature of the industry, I'm sure, that things are upgraded a lot. And there's a new, always a newer, better, shinier model on the go. Um, is that being assessed across the range of other equipment that's been bought? Is there any potential for this to happen anywhere else, given the scale of contract and the time that's taken to run through? And that's not a criticism. It's just there can be a lot of developments in a, a fairly short period. It's a perfectly valid question. I mean, I guess the reality, the gentleman on my right and left will know far better than me. It's a reality of the delivery of any kind of ICT um, capability that things are subject to change and they evolve all the while. Uh, we could not have foreseen the change that we are, uh, we've just talked about. Um, it was out of our hands. It's one of these things that you occasionally will be confronted with uh, and you just have to make sure that there's sufficient flexibility that you can adapt to these changes and ensure that you can still move forward ac according to plan uh, and without uh, significant change to your intended outcomes. Uh, we've been able to do that on this occasion. I can't promise that we 
won't be faced with anything else in the future. But according to our assessment, and again, there are some safeguards there in terms of the contract, uh, because, uh, again, to be clear, it wasn't us that procured this piece of hardware. It was the company that we have uh, contracted to do this, uh, albeit we were involved in the uh, agreement about what kind of hardware was required. Um, but ultimately, there would be safeguards in place so that if we were faced with that kind of eventuality, there would be discussions that could take place to mitigate our exposure. Uh, and does it show the contract's robust, the contract that's in place then? Uh, I believe our contract is very robust, yes. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, the, that you've contracted with, who've now contracted with the other company? So the supplier for ISIC is at Accenture, uh, okay. and that's our primary partner. So any story. losses, any problems, it's all borne by them? Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. There is a oh. robust contract in terms of making sure that uh, we um, take our own respective responsibilities for delivery, uh, and that is all written into the contract. I did mean if there was any hiccups caused by the person they're contracted, contracted with. That's between these two contracting companies. They're your agents, as it were, working. So that I see there's no cost to Police Scotland here That's in right. this. There's delay, but not cost. Yeah. And is that uh, how robust is that contract protecting you as it's where the innocence in this, yeah. if I may put it that way. Well, as, as you know, and as we've discussed uh, at this committee previously, there have been a number of um, sort of twists and turns on this uh, long journey that we, we've had, uh, and the contract has been uh, pretty robust throughout all of that journey, and it's uh, kept us in a, a very strong position. Yes. And so I believe that that's still the case uh, as we sit here today. Mr. Levin, you had a queue there somewhere to come in, <laughs> whether you liked it or not. Yeah, negotiations took place between uh, our, our distributor and the manufacturer of the kit that's being discontinued and the manufacturer of the kit that we're bringing in to replace it. So uh, it's two separate manufacturers of the kit. The company that it was being discontinued uh, from have uh, basically agreed to provide the refund that we originally okay. Uh, was put towards that and then that money has gone to the other company to provide us with kit which is actually of a higher specification than the original kit came in. The decision for us to swap out in advance of launching i6 is absolutely the right decision because the kit that we were originally going to use was going to come end of life so support would have been withdrawn for that during the first year of i6's launch so it was absolute no brainer for us to make sure this was swapped out in advance so we've got fully supported kit. Uh, through the duration of the project. Uh, if I could answer Mr Finney's uh, question as well, is this likely to happen to other stuff that we've got across the board? This is pretty unique. In all my years in industry, this is quite unique. That's something that is basically sold and developed as a flagship product has been withdrawn by the manufacturer. So it is unique, but it's also a very unique component part of i6 as well. The other solutions we've got uh, are the hardware solutions we've got have got full product life cycles ahead of them, guaranteed by the industry, and they are full product life cycles. So this was a unique situation. So I'd be very surprised if anything like that happened. Okay, many thanks indeed. Thank you. Uh, I've got, see, I've got Kevin followed by Margaret followed by Lane. Uh, you keep talking about hardware components kit. What is the actual piece of hardware that has been withdrawn? John Turner. It's a part of storage. So within the i6 uh, portfolio, we have got a, a part of the system that we use to search all the data that is gathered within the system. You know the size of i6, you've got the briefings in front of you, so there's an incredible amount of data uh, covering people, objects, location, events, uh, across uh, every action that will be entered into that. Uh, we need a way to be able to search that when it's in the system. And in order to do that, you need a big disk for it to spin on. So uh, essentially it's storage. So it's uh, tr trying to put it into non-technical terms. It's a big disk that we store everything on that will allow us to search for it fast and pull them back. So if someone wants to look for a red car that was involved in an incident at this particular time, then they'll be able to look into that. It'll pull the information straight back out for us. So it's a key component of the system, the searching facility. I hope that wasn't either too patronising or well, uh, you too technical. Me so. enough on this, I understood that. <laughs> so a, a, a big points. disk rather than um, servers storing the information. Okay. Can uh, you just like, to explain again to somebody who doesn't understand? And other people, a big disk does that require obviously a bigger 
Does it require a bigger slot? I don't know this yeah, stuff. I have to say, I'm, a bigger I'm, slot to put it in in a bigger container. Is that so? It's more than just a big disc. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm despecking the technical description of this Thankfully. quite significantly. But yeah, it's it's something called a storage array, which is uh, when I say big disc, it's actually several discs that plug into one big thing that controls it, and uh, that's the component that we've had to replace. So it's a, it's, it's a physical thing. It's a physical thing. It's not yes. software. It's a physical right. beat piece of kit that we can then, in years to come, we can add more to it so we can give it bigger storage. You're facility. brilliant, I understood that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that does uh, go a long way in explaining. Um, can I ask you in terms of um, the go live date and the rollout date, which are both listed as the 7th of December 2015, yeah. could you explain to us the difference between uh, go live and roll out, um, uh, and why it is both on the same date. Um, that might well just be a, a matter of wording in the in the briefing note. The go live date has um, it is the seventh of December. It has consistently been, and that's what we've been planning towards. So go live is the seventh of December. Roll out is, is simply the term that uh, de describes the kind of period uh, which will be uh, the best part of a, a year, uh, which enables us to ensure that the ISEX capability uh, is available across the Scottish geography. So all uh, areas. Uh, policing areas would have access to and able to use I6. So that is what is referred to when we're talking about uh, rollout. So clearly the rollout will start on go live but won't be completed for uh, several months thereafter. In terms of this delay, um, it means that you've not been able to test the system uh, maybe um, as much as you would have liked before this um, go live date of the 7th of December. How are you going to make sure that all of this is robust enough um, in terms of that 7th of December go-live situation? It's a good question, and I'll ask um, the programme manager, Hamish, to perhaps just unpack that a little bit. But it would be wrong just to, to clarify th that we are, uh, as a consequence of that, that change of hardware, uh, moving ahead without it being tested. It's, it's, that's not the case. What we had done uh, is planned to do what we described as a pilot, but as I say, that was effectively rolling out the capability uh, within a defined operational area in order to test that what it says it can do, it actually does, uh, and we do that in an operational sense. Now, we've had to pull back from that original plan, but we've replaced it with an alternative, which is effectively what we're describing as a model office, uh, and perhaps on that, I'll ask Hamish just to unpack that detail. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably try and touch both things, if I can, members. The, the user acceptance testing we discussed the last time, so that has continued. It's obviously going to have, a, within it, a pause when we swap out the equipment, but the user acceptance testing will continue, so the same number of scripts which cover, if you like, every test condition which our test manager has identified is required to prove that all the requirements which were within the original contract are met. That will still happen. The, the bit that was problematic was we were then going to do what was basically a pilot. And what the pilot is, is not user acceptance testing, but having tested the application is then how does the application work in an operational environment yeah. along with all the processes that underpin it. You know, so when you have a custody, you still print a custody form, you'll still file it, you'll still... So that's quite, quite, still quite an important piece of work before you roll out across the whole of Scotland to make sure it actually works with your processes. Because, frankly, we still have eight different processes across eight different legacy systems, across eight different legacy forces. So it's really quite important to be nail the process part. We obviously are unkeen to do that whilst replacing the hardware. That would just be folly and would introduce risk. So instead of that, we've replaced this with model office testing. So what that is, if you like, is we have a full custody bar within my office in Anderson, which is where the projects run from, etc. And we've identified lots of different processes which we want to test and would have tested within K Division and the Go Live. So we've replaced that with that model office testing. All fully scripted, and basically staff will run through those scripts to ensure that all those processes are followed. Okay. If that makes sense. <laughs> it, it makes perfect sense. But obviously... Um, you are not going to have the ability, as you hope to do, to run it live in a real-life situation in one of the divisions. Is that a real impediment? I understand all of the model office situation uh, and all of the other testing that you're going through, but to ensure its complete and utter robustness, it would have been better to have that uh, live situation in one of the divisions, surely. 
My, my preference would always be a combination of both, to be honest with you. I quite like mod office testing anyway, and I've done that certainly with previous projects, and then supporting a go live within an operational division. For that reason, within the role, what we've done is reduced the first division in the, the next role from the 7th of December. We were originally rolling out against two divisions at that time. We're reducing that to one division, and what we're doing is increasing the amount of business support resource which are in supporting that go live. Uh, so I don't see that as introducing any further risk. We will actually be able to support that risk when we go live with it. So go live on 7th of de December will cover one division? Yes, indeed. Yes, and then how long will it take to roll out across all of the divisions? It's exactly the same period as before. So the contractual period between go live and roll out finishing on the 29th of August next year, that is currently still within the same plan. So it's over a period of time where you will constantly be able to check to ensure that the system is completely and utterly robust. Yes. I mean, ev every go life will be supported by the same resources. So as we roll out, the business support resources roll with the pro project and we'll move into the next division to support them. Each division in turn have also identified a number of staff to support their own rollout as well, who will support their own staff going through, if you like, higher, higher trained people trained to actually floor walk during that period. Mm -hmm. So... That's not no, no change from the original plan, to be honest with you. That was always the intention anyway. OK, thank you. Thank you, convener. Margaret Stenny Lane, please. Um, good afternoon, gentlemen. Kevin's um, touched on the, the user acceptance testing, and, and there were a number of defects in that. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on what actually this involves? Because I'm a bit patchy on that. And exactly what the defects were, because it seems to cover a lot of... Um, very pertinent uh, scenarios like missing people, vulnerable people, various crime, custody events. Yeah. If, I'll, I'll let Hamish um, give some of the detailed answer to that, but I'd like to come in and make a comment about that if I can as well uh, to conclude. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yep. No, 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 I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite, okay, ha quite happy. Okay, happy to accept the mark. Yes, yes, I'm quite happy to accept okay. that qu question. User acceptance testing. I think last time I tried to take you through a test cycle and explain to you how a test cycle works within a software <laughs> programme where several parts of the test cycle are the responsibility of the supplier. So as something is built, the supplier will carry out a thing called unit test that tests the individual components. They link the components, carry out assembly testing. Uh, they then carry out a product test, which is a factory acceptance test of the application. The supplier is responsible for that. User acceptance testing is then our responsibility, which actually carries out test scripts which match operational, uh, the, the much operational environment. The, the point which I'm sure uh, Mr Richardson will come back to just now was, when we finished product test, we should have had no critical or major faults. Mm -hmm. What we found in as we've said within the paper we've given you, what we found in user acceptance testing is we have a higher number of defects than we would have expected at this point in time. And we also have a higher number of major and critical defects, which are obviously we will never go live with major, minor or critical defects. Now, that's an issue for the supplier. So we've challenged the supplier to say how, how are they managing to burn down that defect rate in time to hold the go live date and that, that's basically with them. Uh, the result of that is bits of user acceptance testing have been problematic because we've had scripts blocked with errors and the supplier. Can you explain that a wee bit? I mean, I understand that. Well, yeah, tell us what our, Go back again and don't bother about patronising me. I can't speak. I'm not much better at me this. What's a test script? Give an example of a test script. I take it that an officer's sitting with a, a, a route plan to put stuff into the system. Is that what it is? That's exactly. So a test script, I'll give you a basic example, maybe that we record a crime. So enter the system, record a crime, test to make sure the whole of that crime recording works perfectly. Having recorded the tie crime, attached and accused to the crime. Okay. You know, so the crime is detected and accused is attached. Having attached the accused, we create a Scottish prosecution, a standard prosecution report, and we test all the, a prosecution report. Having created that prosecution report, we send it to the procurator fiscal and through, obviously, this is through our interface testing, and we receive a statement request. Having received a statement request, it gets split up to the officers. The officers okay. complete their statement. And that's just one example. We would have the same for a missing person, no, for I a understand. vulnerable so person, etc. Sorry? So what went wrong? Well, we have a number of defects in there that are actually stopping th those processes. So, for instance, part of the interface between uh, our, our creation of a prosecution report and passing that to the procurator the fiscal is actually faulty, so the data is not appearing in the right fields, uh -huh. and the manufacturer, as a result, has to go back and uh -huh. sort the defects. Uh -huh. You always get defects at this point in time,
but quite frankly, the defects are of a higher magnitude than we would have expected at this point in time, and actually a higher criticality. Some of them are majors and actually stop the scripts from even running. That's the issue. Margaret, I needed to know that. But yeah, I know you yeah, didn't, no, that, but I that's needed good. To know For that. examples, they're always good. <laughs> um, and, and if I may just to sort of, um, I suppose, top and tail that. I mean, in terms of the, the, the committee's interest in I6, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And on an ongoing basis, I know you've sustained that interest. It's certainly been incredibly helpful to en enable us to keep the profile and keep the momentum necessary. Uh, and it helps also reinforce the criticality of this programme. Um, the police. Well, uh, We're not supposed you know, to be here doing that. <laughs> indeed, but that's, that's the reality of it from my perspective. And again, you've heard me say before, and I'll say again today, that this programme, as we've gone through, remains on scope, on budget and on message. Uh, and we are uh, following a schedule for delivery. And all of that is great. In fact, Audit Scotland have picked that up by using I6 as an exemplar in a recent publication they've, they've brought forward. But as well, as part of that, and hopefully the committee will take some reassurance of the rigour that is put in around making sure that what we are doing uh, it delivers the outcomes that we're seeking. Uh, but I should also, just on the context of, of defects, uh, highlight to you that uh, we've always acknowledged the complexity, size and scale of this programme. There is no doubt about that. But at the same time, we have an expectation that there is um, an effective level of contribution to address difficulties and overcome the unforeseen obstacles moving forward. Uh, it seems to me where we are at the moment that the supplier uh, has... Uh, not perhaps been delivering the performance that I had expected, uh, certainly in breaking down some of these defects within the timescales that we expect, uh, I expect. And as a consequence, there was a fairly robust uh, board meeting. The last board meeting was the 28th of August. Uh, during that, uh, and again to be clear, Accenture have been consistent in their messaging that this is resolvable, that they have got available resource to draw down in order to get this uh, dealt with prior to go live. Uh, however, there is an experience that we've had so far where we have had cause to challenge quality issues uh, and over-ambitious uh, over approach to certain things. Uh, and as a consequence, I, I was not reassured at that board meeting that what they were bringing forward was a credible plan to enable them to do what is necessary uh, to enable us to go live on the 7th of December. Now, that's a fairly significant issue. Uh, and as a consequence, I've asked them uh, to come forward to a special board meeting that I've asked for on the 15th of September uh, and at that board meeting I will expect them to prevent, uh, provide plans and uh, uh, an overwhelming assurance that what they have in place will enable them to do what we require them to do to enable us to go live on the 7th of December. It would be wrong of me to come to the committee and not flag that up uh, but I suppose just to moderate that you know, because of previous discussions, this has been an incredibly difficult journey. In 30 years in policing, this is the most complicated uh, delivery programme I've ever, ever experienced, and that continues. So, in a sense, I wouldn't want to put flags up around this. Uh, Accenture have been consistent in their message that they can, they can do what's required. They also, at that board meeting, indicated uh, in excess of 90 per cent a confidence rating for delivery. So uh, what I'm describing to you is, I suppose, just the rigour of the programme arrangements to say uh, we are not at the moment satisfied that what's being presented uh, is of the appropriate standard on quality and therefore uh, we will come together on the 15th. If on the 15th they manage to secure that confidence, then we will carry on exactly as we've highlighted to you. If not, then we might need to consider some revision. And if that does happen, I will clearly uh, inform the committee. And I suppose that if there is... Uh, uh, yes, I understand. If there are further delays uh, to the implementation and there's a knock-on effect to, to the training of officers, and you've obviously um, considered this could be a possibility, are there contingencies in plan uh, in place to, to negate this, uh, this necessity? There are contingencies, and, and, and there is kind of, uh, just because of operational uh, realities where unforeseen things can happen that mean that we can't progress training, this, this is no different to that. So from the outset, irrespective of what I've just described, there was a degree of flex built into the training requirement to enable us uh, to kind of ad adapt to what I'm, I'm certain will happen anyway, just in terms of uh, life events and, and things that the police will need to respond to. So there is. Perhaps Hamish could provide some further detail in 
around that. Yeah, certainly, can members. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't build in some kind of contingency. So there, there is contingency in with, uh, for example, the hardware swapper. We have contingency within there. We have contingency within the general plan that takes us up to the 7th of December. And also, we have contingency thereafter as well. So. So theoretically, if we do have some movement, which, you know, again, as Mr. Richardson's expressed, the supplier says there's no reason to have that concern just now because they are, you know, uh, they have resources and they have, you know, in the past we have had high level of defects in product tests. They very, very quickly turned on resource and burned those defects down and held the date. Uh, but however, it would be foolish of us not to plan some contingency. So we have contingency in training and as much as... Uh, from the last person being trained or the first person being trained to the date of the go live, we can actually extend that and still fall within best practice for training, if that makes sense. Okay. Yes, although burn defects down is a new one on me, but I'll oh, bear apologies. that in mind. <laughs> Alison. <laughs> Resolve. Really, really, just a supplementary there. When you talk about the board, you mean the I6 programme board? Yes. Yes, sorry. fine. Thanks. Fine. I have other questions. But no, but I'll, I'll yeah, no, you're quite right. You chair it if you like. I'm, I'm quite happy. So <laughs> um, on you go, Elaine. Right, thanks. Just on uh, the, you, you mentioned about the, the, the storage array, which uh, has been changed. Um, what sort of backup is there for your system? Yeah, uh, full backup. We've got backup solutions that will uh, safely uh, guard against any data loss mm -hmm. and will allow easy recovery of the solutions. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's different legislation with how long we should retain data and then when we should destroy data. So our backup solutions have so got all that fully built in. There's backup elsewhere, a data farm or whatever that's accessible by cloud yeah. user. Yeah, yeah. the, yeah. the i data model operates between two main data centres. Obviously, I can't give you the locations no, of the public environment, but there's two main data centres that will replicate data between the two data centres. Okay. What about um, you know the progress being made with the transfer of legacy data? How is that going? So the transfer of legacy data, you'll notice in your briefing papers, it refers to something called the IDAP program, which is uh, utilising some technology, uh, which allows us to access legacy data in real time. So if anyone is looking for data records that, for example, are four, five, six, mm -hmm. et cetera, years old, uh, then that uh, information will access the legacy data sets and produce that as in real time on the system. Mm -hmm. And that, there's no delays or nothing? Uh, no, it's, uh, that, the, that, the that user that wouldn't know there are a browsing an external data set at that stage. It will all be as if they were browsing the original i6 database. Okay. I don't know if you want to expand there's, on that, Hamish. There's possibly some. Uh, there, there's no delays in there. That's completely tracking on track. Uh, what I would say is a rollout. So the intention when i6 goes live, that will cover specifically vulnerable people because we currently have a national vulnerable people mm -hmm. database. And it's quite important that as i6 rolls out, obviously, some people will be on the existing system, some people will be on the new system. So it's important that the people on the existing interim vulnerable people database mm -hmm can see the stuff in I6 and vice versa. So vulnerable people will be there for go live and missing people will be there for go live. So we have a national view of missing mm -hmm. people. As the system rolls out, and bluntly also on economics of when legacy systems, software renewal was due, et cetera, et cetera, we will replace the other data sets. And then by the time the, the last of the legacy systems is due to be, if you like, uh, decommissioned, by that time the I whole of IDAP will be formed and all legacy data will sit within there, if that makes sense to members. And you were absolutely certain that the programme will be fully rolled out by the 16th of September, or whatever, by September next year, is it? Um, there's no possibility, because there's obviously been slippage in the past, there's no possibility that could of further slippage, given that there's still some issues within the system. Well, again, um, notwithstanding what I've said already, th this is always subject to kind of variation and change, and, <laughs> and the journey so far has presented a series of, of challenges that we've had to find uh, a way to overcome. But, but we have done that, and we've managed to stay on message. I suppose, from my perspective, uh, and, and the committee is aware of this, um, I6 represents a, a game-changing capability, mm. uh, and it is literally a generational shift for all police officers and staff mm. delivering service. Therefore, the prize is incredibly high, uh, and the priority around delivery is, is as strong as it can be. So, again, mm -hmm. I, I would wish you to take some reassurance that we will move heaven and earth to make mm -hmm. sure that this is rolled out uh, and provided to staff across Police Scotland um, as expeditiously mm -hmm. as we possibly mm -hmm. can. But, again, I absolutely guarantee we'll be around this table again in the future talking about some other foreseen, unforeseen uh, changes that undoubtedly will happen. If the experience of new IT systems throughout the public sector has not always been happy and that there have Indeed. often been un unforeseen uh, 
issues which have caused problems and caused delays and so on. That, that's absolutely right. Although, again, where we are in terms of this particular programme is that we've gone through a, a great deal of, of uh, work and the system is constructed, it is built, it is designed, uh, and we are at the testing stage. So there's a significant amount of momentum already there. Uh, and much of the, the change moving forward, we should take some confidence again from although the K Division pilot, as described, uh, has been changed, the work that was done by K Division officers officers I think was exceptional. Uh, they um, had themselves in a position of readiness, they'd done appropriate communications, people were ready to roll with that pilot uh, and again observing from my perspective I took considerable reassurance that if that is an indicator of how the other divisions when they reach that point uh, absorb the requirement uh, then I think there's real reason for optimism. Can I just ask you a daft lassie question? Is it, accent, is it Accenture that develop the systems? In essence, are they, they are. the systems people and the hardware providers are different things? I understand the hardware provider. Are they the systems people? There's probably a blend. I'll let Hamish answer. They, Accenture are our primary customer. Ah, uh, and what I'm trying to get at is this: is you, I think you mentioned Chief Superintendent McPherson the date of the 29th of August next year is the date for the rollout to be completed. Yes, that's correct. I took a note of that. But then, and I quite rightly, my colleague pressed you on what if there's further slippage. And what I want to know is, it's very easy. For instance, I say somebody to build a wall for me, and they say I'll build it by the end of September. And it's not built and there's slippage and it goes on. It goes on. You know, there's nothing, perhaps I've got them in a contract that says, you don't do it by that time. Penalties come into place and you want to have, be in the front foot. So I want to know with Accenture that if it goes beyond that, well, you can't roll the whole thing out for right reasons. Are there any penalty clauses? Not just that you don't pay a bill, but you have penalty clauses in place so that money comes back to Police Scotland because they've got a bit of elastic that can keep stretching in terms of the contract. Yeah, perhaps, convener, I, I can answer that. Uh, yes, the, the, the go-live date of December is actually a, it's a contractual go-live date. <coughs> you know, the previous milestones regarding I'm the pilot, I'm talking about the complete rollout. I'm, I've yes, heard that bit. Well, I'm no. talking about 29th of August. If it doesn't, if you can't manage for reasons that the system defects or something, are there penalties in place to funding to come back to Police Scotland? Because you're on all this hassle. Uh, sorry, could be that's what I was trying to come to, so to be honest with you. Uh, as soon as the date passes in December, if the if the it's not fit for roll to that point in time in our first contractual go live, the supplier is automatically liable for penalties. So there are, there are penalties can to be you. attracted from that directly to Police Scotland. Uh -huh. Yes. And are there further bits down, further down the line in the and contract each, each with of, other penalties? Each of the milestones has penalties against them, including the, what final, are the, penalties? Including the final road. I mean, that's, that's, obviously com, that's obviously commercial, and yet they put it this way, they would not want to reach they that want position. To them. That's uh, we would, good to know. We'd certainly not hope to, hope to cover that. The, the, the issue we have just now, just for clarity for earlier on, regarding the hardware, if you like, the, the hardware is it's a turnkey contract through Accenture, and the hardware was specced by them but agreed no, by Scotland. No, I understand Scotland. that distinction. I was just interested to separate yeah. the difference between there are no costs to you in terms of to pay out more. What I'm looking to is do you have a sort of Damocles to some extent over Accenture who may have won over the hardware but so that you say, here's a deadline. They don't have it by then. You pay money to us. There, there, there are significant uh, contract points, shall we say, which would make yeah. it particularly unattractive okay. run past any of the milestone dates past the go live. Because that makes people focus on delivering on time. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's Alison, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just, <laughs> right. I just thought we were getting away with there's no additional costs too much. And I wanted to know about the other way around. Uh, Margaret. Yeah. Since we have a little bit of time, I wonder if you could explain just now or confirm just now, I know the divisions are still using their legacy computers uh, until I6 uh, becomes operational and that na the national element to the custody process has resulted in what they say is a additional pressure on busy, uh, busy custody suites recording identical information both on hard copy and electronically. Now, is that continuing just now? Is it likely to continue to roll out? And will that be resolved when um, the, the new system is eventually rolled out? 
Yeah. Yes, when, I, when I6 is rolled off fully, obviously we'll have a single integrated custody system across the whole of Scotland and anybody in custody across the whole of Scotland can see the whiteboard of the custody suite anywhere else in Scotland. So, but obviously to reach that point, there's a rollout, you know, so as, as the first divisions go live, they gain the benefit of I6, but the other ones don't. But what we have is business processes in place to ensure they still maintain the visibility of people in custody across the whole of Scotland. I'm not going to claim I'm an expert in that area because that obviously belongs to custody division, but obviously my business change uh, staff, if you like, work with custody division to actually deal with those business change elements during the rollout. I think it was both the hard copy and electronically they felt was a duplication that was adding to, to work when they're already under pressure. So that's continuing and likely to continue to the rollout as a, a belt and braces. Is that the idea? I mean, I, I think it's, in, in terms of context, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that I6 underpins reform. And in fact, it is, it's critically important moving forward to enable national uh, capabilities. But I6 isn't the only area. Uh, and there are a number of areas where uh, the forces, you know, interim measures had to be put in place and it will take time to move to a position where all legacy forces can communicate in a slick, common fashion. But actually, the, we have made significant progress around trying to uh, address as much of that in a prioritised way as possible. Uh, and in contrast to where we were before, uh, without kind of... Um, wagging fingers at all in relation to legacy arrangements, but the reality around trying to deliver national solutions in the legacy setup was inordinately difficult because there was no single line of decision making. So uh, there were very few successful deliveries of national programmes uh, under legacy arrangements. Since we've come into being as Police Scotland, we've rolled out 21 national systems, some of these being interim arrangements, but they have enabled uh, a communication and a flow of information and process across various business areas uh, to enable the business to, to flow. So yes, there are still some areas where there is a less than optimal kind of reality for, for, for staff who might have to duplicate to some extent. But uh, we have plans in place to address all of that. And once we get I6 coming on stream, for example, uh, then much of that will be reduced. But it's not just I6. There are other elements as well that will enhance that. But it, it is just important to stress that fact that um, none of this happens overnight. Uh, I6 has actually been on the kind of books now for some six years. It's taken us uh, to, to get to that point of delivery. Uh, and so, you know, I, I guess we, we need to be realistic and patient about how we can improve and uh, address all of these concerns in a national way. Yeah, I understand that. But specifically on the custody process, are they still having the hard copy and the electronic copy? And how long is that likely to continue? It's going to be different in different parts of the, the, the country, which is it's difficult to know without an exact... Dumfries and Galloway. Yeah, the Dumfries and Galloway uh, system will get replaced when I6 rolls out, and prior to that, they will maintain the system they've currently got because it is, you know, as you say, it is possibly not the most efficient way, but it is definitely belt and braces to ensure that people are kept safe within custody. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's any chance of, you know, I, th I think there's always a danger in leaving that burden earlier, and you're quite confident that would be okay. You're, you're always looking to do that. We would always look at something. What you don't want to do is introduce something which actually in itself creates a risk to sure. create efficiency, and wow. there is always a balance. Okay, give me a warrant to move on. You've got a last one, have you? Uh, what to stop it too, is I warned you. Just, just um, finally, convener, um, in terms of where you're at now and the entire process, you've previously, in Police Scotland, uh, well, not Police Scotland, but in the police forces, had bad experiences with... Uh, trying to create uh, these kind of systems. Um, as Elaine pointed out earlier, the public sector as a whole uh, has had some pretty bad experiences with the rollout of new systems. During the course of all of this, uh, and I know that you've had lots of gateway processes in place and all of the rest of it to make sure that this runs as smoothly as possible, are you also, at the end of this, uh, going to have a post-mortem of where things went right and where things went wrong and are you going to share um, your findings not only uh, with your own colleagues in Police Scotland but in other parts of uh, the public sector as well in terms of the delivery mm. of such a complex system. 
I mean, the simple answer to that would be yes, we certainly are, although we're not waiting until the end to do a kind of post-implementation debrief. This is almost an ongoing uh, reality for us. So at the various stages, we are having a look at the, the, the learning that's come from different stages of this uh, and uh, making adjustments as we go. Uh, this will continue to be difficult, and it is going to take time before we get to the ultimate rollout position. Uh, and so I have no, no doubt that we will need to remain focused and continue to put the effort in to make sure that we get the outcomes that we, we seek. Uh, I have on a number of occasions ha been in discussion with colleagues from uh, out with policing uh, around our general experience uh, and uh, I, I believe that that's something that is, is incredibly worthwhile actually just sharing in the kind of public sector context specifically uh, some of that learning to hopefully safeguard others or, or give others uh, a bit of a helping hand with regard to avoiding some of the pitfalls that undoubtedly are there. Thank you. Thank that's, you that's fine. That's a, a good place to conclude. Thank you very much. I thank you for your attendance. We're now moving into private session. So I'd ask the public gallery to clear, please.